Well, welcome to another episode of Digging In. I hope all's well with you wherever you are and hope you're staying safe during this uh, season of COVID-19 and everything else. Um, the question that we're going to look at today is actually has a lot of different layers to it. Um, we've had a viewer over the last couple of weeks who I'm assuming is an unbeliever because of some of the comments that this person has made um, about creationism being for morons and it's uh, based on lies and um, you know other things like that and of course I'm not gonna um, you know return any name calling or anything like that I'm I am a grown man so I've got better things to do than just you know stay behind a keyboard and type insults but I did want to give this person the respect to answer their questions because that's what this question what this channel is about the channel is about differing opinions differing perspectives and um, you know I've tried to make it an open forum where people with differing ideas can come and present their ideas and I kind of want to stay that way you know name calling or you know just deciding to use something like the fallacy of like a genetic uh, fallacy where you say well because this person believes this that means the rest of it is just crap and you know nothing that you do is going to be contributing to science I would have a hard time calling people like Linnaeus and Kepler and Newton and Boyle and you know a lot of these other great scientific minds of the last several hundred years I would have a really hard time calling them fools when it comes to science uh, people like Benjamin Franklin who was a self-proclaimed deist you know um, he believed in something greater and he was one of the great inventors of the 1700s and is still revered as a great mind you know this viewer also even mentioned that the scientific method is what they live by and they're very confident in their knowledge of the subjects in which they engage in dialogue and debate but I would have you know that one of the greatest minds to ever live that is given credit for a lot of what we use the scientific method for today is Sir Francis Bacon who get ready for this was also a creationist um, he's even quoted as saying God has in fact written two books not just one of course we are all familiar with the first book he wrote namely scripture but he has written a second book called creation now Sir Francis Bacon was not an infallible human being the only person to ever accomplish that was God himself in the form of Jesus Christ second part of the Trinity but when we look at science someone's worldview is absolutely irrelevant to being able to conduct good research and innovate products when it comes to the hard scientific data and the um, information that they're able to use to make new things now with that being said this person has also said well you know creationism's not doing anything to drill for oil creationism's not doing anything to solve COVID-19 or anything like that again you would have to have researched every single person who's credible in their field who's researching or practicing medicine or whatever you would have to have a way of measuring their preconceived notions their biases towards creation or against creation and you'd have to have some measurable way of being able to justify whether or not their belief makes them credible that is a matter of opinion it's a matter of perspective so you can't just look at somebody and say well because they believe this that means I can't believe anything else they say absolutely not some of my favorite teachers and professors throughout my education have been people with opposing viewpoints I had a professor when I was getting my undergrad in uh, geology I had a professor who was a devout atheist he was very much against God he had grown up in a Christian environment and he had come to the conclusion over time that the natural sciences were the only way to define um, you know what we see today and he just had a disclaimer from the very beginning he said I don't care what you believe I don't care what your perspective is even though I debate this across the country I will not in any way try to convert you he said get your uh, grade in the class make a passing grade and move on and I took that advice and I really respected him for that he didn't try to convert anybody he just did his job he taught the information from a perspective that most of us didn't agree with and we all went on got our degrees and now we can work we can teach the information that we're required to teach but we also in this country have freedom of speech 
and we can share our perspectives or our convictions on things that um, you know are not always necessarily mainstream. So even if you're the only person who endorses something, that doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean that somebody, you know, you should uh, cower down to somebody who's trying to bully you either online or, you know, uh, in person. Um, you're welcome to have your own perspective. And even if you're the only one who believes it, that is perfectly fine. Now, with that being said, I want to give some information attempting to answer this question. And I know that, you know, probably will not be sufficient enough evidence to convert this person because the only way this person is going to have their mind changed is having their heart change first. And that's why we do this. This channel is not about making money. If I never make a cent on it, that's perfectly fine. I enjoy talking about these topics and I enjoy engaging with people that have similar and different perspectives. So let's take a look at a few things. Now I try to maintain um, as much consistency as I can between Scripture being the foundation for everything that I believe, and then also taking the scientific evidence and applying that to Scripture, because that's the way that I do my science, is I look at it through a biblical lens, whereas someone else may look at it and say, no, I cannot use God, I cannot use supernatural means, I can only use what I'm given. And that in itself is a fallacy, because what you've done is you've eliminated the only rational you know, explanation for how we're even here to start off with. You know, this universe did not create itself, and it's not eternal. Laws of thermodynamics do not allow for that. And, you know, when somebody says, well, who created God? Well, they're assuming that we believe in a God that was created. I have to take it on faith that there's an eternal God out there that created this universe and that he is self-existing in the fact that I don't understand that. I can't explain that to you. But you also, with the opposing viewpoint are left with this burden to prove to me that the universe did create itself, you know, was there a reason, was there a purpose, and even if it was able to do that, how could it continue on and on making more complex things from one singularity, from one uh, component that expanded and gained intelligence and energy over time? Um, this person has also even made statements about synthetic life and different things in the laboratories, which we'll address in another video on um, the impossibilities of how COVID-19 does not demonstrate a creator. So let's look at a few things from creationists on oil and on the geologies. Dr. Tim Clary, who's written for a lot of different publications, but Institute for Creation Research, he has two articles, and I'm going to put both of those in the description below, and I'd like for you to read those if you're, if you're interested in this topic. One is from 2013, and the other one is from 2014, and he's continued to publish, and he's continued to go on site to places like the Grand Canyon and Devil's Tower and all these other geological phenomena that we have here in the United States, and he's been across the world as well. Now, in Clary's article from 2014, he is quoted as saying, Let's first look at the biblical record. In Genesis 11:3, in the narration about the building of the Tower of Babel, God says they had brick for stone, they had asphalt for mortar. The Hebrew word for asphalt is kemar, which is sometimes translated as bitumen, cement, or slime. So here, unlike the use of the Hebrew word kofer, the Bible is describing a tar or a bitumen product, essentially a hydrocarbon. Now, of course, hydrocarbons are what are emitted today into our atmosphere when we burn off fossil fuels. So the idea that hydrocarbons came around with just humans is actually false. Now, we can debate on how, how old the earth is, and you know we can do that in another session, but um, at the time of Noah, which I firmly believe was probably somewhere around 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, there was already asphalt and slime and pitch and tar um, that was available. So that means that something was causing them to be able to have access to these products. Now it's very possible that after the flood occurred, you know, you had this rapid amount of water pressure from underneath, the fountains of the deep broke open, and you had all this internalized pressure and heat that was now exposed up to Earth's surface which means that there were probably things that had been dying and there was energy stored in the earth already. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind, 
you know, scoffers are going to look at this and they're going to say, well, it takes millions of years for oil to form. It doesn't take thousands of years. And from this timetable, you're saying that the earth was probably about 1,500 to 2,000 years old when Noah lived. Okay? And that is what I believe. I believe it was somewhere around that time frame. But you've got laboratory tests such as in uh, 2013, the U.S. Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory reported that they were able to harvest algae into crude oil in less than an hour. And they've generated these in lab settings as, or as soon as 12 hours, which means that they're taking algae, which only takes three to four weeks to form, and they're converting it um, into actual usable oil and types of energy that different businesses and automobiles and different things could possibly utilize on a much larger scale on an industrial level uh, in coming years. That is, if we run out of the fossil fuels that we already have. So if you look at you know, the amount of heat that is you know, created inside of the Earth today, you know, you've got geysers at like Yellowstone National Park that are anywhere from 113 to 200 plus degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, if we've got algae and we've got different materials that are essentially in the ocean 4,500 years ago, it could be very possible that a lot of that oil that was produced, you know, 40, you know, 4,000 plus years ago, began its process and was cooked for that long of a time period and just had massive amounts of energy stored within it that it is, you know, able to be able to create the oil that we use today uh, as a main source of energy. Now, something that's interesting, and I'm going to put this graphic up here so that you can see it. The answer is the Great Flood, an event that rapidly deposited thousands of feet of sediments across the continents, burying and placing huge amounts of marine sediments containing algae, plankton on the continental crust. It says the organic debris was trapped faster than it could naturally decay. In many cases, like in the deep sedimentary basins in Wyoming, up to 30 to 40,000 feet of sediments were deposited during the year-long flood and most of these deposits were clay and shell. And of course, clay and shell are primary sources for crude oil and its production, which of course, mixed with the whole idea that algae does not take long to produce, and the fact that algae has been proven now in laboratories to be able to be used to produce from crude oil to be able to produce usable energy sources, this is something that could possibly have been one of our early forms of fossil fuels. Now, for people who are actually seeking oil, the strata within the earth is very complex. And you've got a combination of different hydrocarbons with this crude oil, with shale and clay, that's mixed all throughout into various layers. So it's a very complex thing. The Middle East is a great example. It seems to have just the right you know, formula and the right timing, pressure, heat, um, to be able to build up the reserves that you know, we now find there. So it you know, just seemed to be the right conditions for the Middle East to be such a central point for being able to produce so many fossil fuels. You know, it also shows you what kind of event the global flood would have had to have been. We have such a deep, organic, rich set of layers, strata within the Earth that um, has all kinds of energy stored within it. And there have been different studies done, and I'll put that in the description box as well, and you can look and see from a creationist perspective um, how we have an energy-rich lithosphere that contains all kinds of energy deposits of different types of oil and different fossil fuels. Now, secular geologists are going to tell you that the oil that we're getting, that we're fracking and digging out of the earth, is hundreds of millions of years old, and that it has to be that old. But here's a thought. If oil really took that long to form, here's a thought. If the earth was really that old and the oils were brought to the surface, they would actually be destroyed by bacterial action, which means that they would all dissipate and be gone. There wouldn't be anything left. So this whole idea that oil has to be millions of years old is actually something that's very easy to disprove. Organic compounds cannot last for millions of years. I mean, you look back to 2010, the big oil spill that occurred in the Gulf. You had oil that was at the surface being consumed by bacteria, which is essentially everywhere. Um, and, you know, whether it's at the surface or at the deepest parts of the ocean, oil would be consumed in such a short period of time, it wouldn't even be able to last for thousands of years, more or less millions of years. So the whole idea that, 
you know, things that are organic in particular can survive for millions and millions of years is something that's easy to disprove, easy to disprove, especially from a young earth creationist perspective. To, to get back to this whole idea about algae production and um, being able to innovate biofuels, ExxonMobil published a 2018 article where they said they plan to have 10,000 barrels a day by the year 2025, which I think is pretty interesting considering algae is very quickly produced in just a few weeks. So I think it's interesting that you know algae is something that we continue to bring up as something that's very, very simple in terms of um, you know its complexity versus a lot of other organisms, but the fact that it's something that forms very quickly and can be used for different types of energy sources. So there's a company out of Dallas, Texas that also partnered with the Nation of Israel, and they are a biblical creationist-based company. And they are on the New York Stock Exchange, and although their prices are very low right now, um, they are currently drilling for oil in Israel, and they are continuing to do what they can to find oil reserves there. And um, I've got a couple of their scriptures that um, you know are a central part of their, their company, just to show that there are people in the oil business who are creationists, who are Bible believers, who are Christians, and they are doing real science. So the whole notion that creationism is just useless in the oil industry is absolutely absurd. And um, I've got a lot of links that I'll post here below. Obviously, I could go on and on and on with disproving this whole idea that creationism is useless in oil production and oil acquisitions. But my main goal is obviously, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's my main concern. If you have questions, if you want to know how you can be saved, if you want to know, um, you know, pure joy in serving the Lord, I'll be more than happy to spend time sharing that with you. Um, continue to do your research. Hang in there. Uh, do the best you can. Teach the truth. And uh, God bless. We'll see you soon.